welcome back to my messy desk or at least you can't see the mess on one end of the desk and that's deliberate so that I look like I'm clean and organized unlike everybody else anyway this begs the question what are we doing today well we have decently sized cable here and a couple of Anderson plugs I'm going to connect an Anderson plug to each end of this so that I can connect trolling battery to the Argo, which is one of these guys you see up in the corner here. I have an eight-wheel drive amphibious vehicle. The trolling motor, sometimes I like to connect to the engine so I can charge it while I'm traveling. Or I may need to jump start, but I also have another project coming up. I'm going to put an override switch on the lighter socket and phone charger on there so that I can run off the battery when there's no key or ignition in. Um, that also means for an upcoming video, I'll be able to charge my gear straight from the Argo. I have plans or at least conceptual ideas of a video coming up where I'm going to take the Argo to an island in private ownership that uh, I'm going to camp on for the night and use only the equipment that I keep under the seat of the Argo. And this is something I'd like to keep under the seat of the Argo. Mostly because I'm setting things up to do a bit of a test run in case I ever got stuck. Um, now, a little while ago, to give you some backstory, um, I got stuck um, babysitting uh, a white pointer shark, in fact, two of them, uh, in an undisclosed location. And I had to uh, wait for fisheries to come and pick them up uh, on behalf of a marine biologist that wanted them. The result of that is I had to rely on some of the stuff under the seat, and I had a fairly basic kit under there. I needed a little bit of ibuprofen. I had to dip into my emergency reserve of two liters of water, um, and I needed some water. I was there for about five and a half hours, and uh, originally I had taken off to go and pass through that area for a short amount of time, um, and I hadn't eaten for about four hours prior to that, and uh, I didn't expect to be away for any more than about 20 minutes, just enough to go up and uh, get some GPS coordinates and come back. So all of that got me thinking, along with the fact that um, I've got 120 boxes of something else show up. I had 14.65 kilograms of these show up, good quality hexi tabs, much better than the, uh, the other ones. You'll see in my previous video all about them. We don't need to talk about them here. Anyway, let's get on to my unorthodox way of connecting Anderson plugs, um, because that has been a point of contention for some people. I want to explain how and why I do things and uh, some minor points that aren't the problem that people think they are. Anyway, let's get on with it. All right, well, the first task here is pretty much the obvious one, is strip off enough of the insulation here that we can get to the wires. This is, of course, double insulated stuff. Now, on a normal day, I'd take a sheep's foot blade and run that up the edge of the cable here but uh, that finger is help, not helping me with the leverage on that and I don't know what I did with my sheep's foot blade it's probably sitting just behind the camera somewhere now when I get to this point I've got a nice little uh, I guess we could call that almost a foreskin going there anyway we're going to chop the foreskin off here with flush cutters and this is going to give us a nice clean edge this cable is fairly unruly when you want to twist it like this. Then we rip the foreskin off and we have a nice circumcised cable entry here. The other thing I'm going to do here before I get too distracted is get these nice and level. We're going to go over here and grab our wire strippers. I'm going to flip that plastic thing out of the way. I'm going to strip off the, about the length that we need should be about right and just a slight sweat twist to stop them splaying but not so much of a twist as to increase their diameter too much all right I'm going to repeat this for the other end all right I found my sheep's foot blade here's the trick you run it down this is nice stiff cable so I'm holding it right back against the bench here you want to get down between the two cables being careful to follow the direction of the cable so that you don't miss your finger and you don't nick the inner insulation, which is easy to do. I hope you don't mind my apprentice in the background. All right, do the same trick as we did before. 
my apprentice has got some grievance with Roblox apparently. You'll hear that in the background. All right, let's keep going. Now for this bit we need to change the way our workspace is laid out. We are going to need something heat resistant. This is the side of an old Dell T3500 or no this is off a of Dell T5400. They look pretty much the same. This one was dropped during shipping and deformed it just enough that it's not worth putting back on. We are going to remove my keyboard well out of the way. This will all become clear soon. Oh and the $50 note fairy left a pineapple under my keyboard. All right. Now, there's a lot of you guys that would like to crimp these. Now, I have a giant set of ratchet crimpers with multiple jaws. I've got even bigger ones as well that work for these terminals. However, my experience with terminals and copper wire here that is not tinned in an environment that is sometimes highly saline and also wet um, such as the brackish water around here these things corrode or the crimp fails and they pull back out or whatnot and yeah sure if you do a decent crimp they'll stay in but I prefer to use these as a solder cup now the first complaint I hear about this is people go what happens if the solder crystallizes in here and all that if you've done a solder join properly it's not going to crystallize Secondly, if you use flux, and I use flux core solder that helps deal with that, and you get things hot enough, they bond together. They form almost an alloy. So crystallize all you want. That will help it stay in there. In fact, it solder crystallizes when it comes back to a solid state anyway. It doesn't really work hard. The third thing I do is I tin these. I heat them up. I put a bit of solder in. I make sure that that solder and copper or that, that tin copper and lead alloy is happening right on the surface of this anyway so it makes it fairly well easy to bond and th uh, fourthly I also preheat these before they go in but you'll see all that happen anyway the first thing we're going to do is get some of the tin lead solder and a gas torch and we're going to tin these things now the reason I use a gas torch is my biggest iron is this big and uh, the next iron down is only this big so uh, there's no way in hell I'm going to make that work even on 150 watts so uh, we need gas flame so let's get that happening now as usual I have several sizes of everything now I have some Duratech flux core solder here that's 0.71 mil that is completely useless for this the most common stuff I use is 1 mil um, ideally you really need something a bit thicker for this and I have a brand new roll of stuff as well this one's lasted me well over 12 months at this point, although doing this stuff you use a lot of it. Now I have baby Misty Stoner Torch which is out of gas. This is good for small stuff, but useless for this. I have Mr. Stoner, Stor Stoner Torch Junior which will sort of work. And then for doing the big stuff I have Stoner Torch Senior. Good stuff, but wastes a bucket ton of gas. So let's get this stuff tinned. Now the first thing I like to do with any of this is get everything sort of prepped and secured somehow. So I like to train this cable in such a way that it's going to stay where I want it. And I use these things as kind of forceps. So I get them to hold things in place. I'm going to reel out an appropriate bit of solder here. And we're going to make sure our camera angle can see everything. That's about where I want to be. Cool. I can't see the viewfinder from that angle. Stoner Torch Junior should be enough to get these guys starting to tin. Just want to get this hot enough to suck in that solder. And just get that starting to alloy in there. Should soak in nicely. This is also one of the things that helps with that corrosion and sucking water down in through the weave of the copper. This is the whole idea, we need to get this hot enough that it will take up a fair amount of solder in there and get it into the weave. And not burn my already injured finger in the process. The other problem with these torches is once they get to a certain temperature, they don't work so well. This guy you've got to use at a fair distance. 
and the technique is a little different with a bigger torch. Alright, certainly much quicker though. Alrighty, now let's get my favourite stuff out. So, for the next step, I like to use my all time favourite stuff, which is Blue Tack. And it's a Bostic brand, if I recall, and it's uh, spelt B L U T A C. And uh, actually, I'll get a pa pack of it and show you. Now, I'm not sure why more people don't use this stuff. Um, it's about two bucks a pack for four strips in the supermarket, and it's amazingly handy for so many things. I think I'm using some of it for a cable grommet on the Argo for a cable I intend to remove. All right, now, the way you probably notice when I've put these in here, I've put the flats facing me, and they're both parallel. That's important. Why that's important is when I go to put these cables in, I'm going to put them in parallel to each other. And I want them to go in nice and evenly in here and not twist up like this. That makes an important difference. Turn some slack off the end here. Now we're going to get these hot, which means prepping the solder. Now, traditionally, I don't like to handle solder because of what it's made out of. At least this stuff anyway. The lead-free stuff is just difficult to work with, especially if you've grown up using this. I wash my hands fairly thoroughly, which would be nice to do with Solvol if they still made the stuff. They only make liquid now. They don't make the blocks of Solvol, so I can't get the mechanical scrubbing action I used to. I'm decidedly butthurt about that, if you can't help tell. So, if you are a rep for Solvol, let my voice be heard. Start making the stuff again. We've got a pool of flux sitting on the top. We're going to get our wires positioned right. We're going to get this hot and we're going to sink it back in. Alright. Now we need to hold this for a moment while it solidifies. Alright, it's cool enough to hold in there but we're going to let it go for a few more minutes. I'll show you the trick to get the solder off that contact or the blue tack rather I'll show you that once it cools off now we need to do the other one so we're going to do that shortly all right so the trick here is to get this hot move the gas torch away and get the solder flowing in first then put the gas torch on otherwise you're going to have a month of Sundays trying to get it in there and you're going to get it all on the outside there's a little bit less gas this time Wait till it actually melts first and get it into that pool. Then we can move it in here fast enough that it doesn't have time to melt outside. Right, there's our cup full. Get our other wire prepared. Get everything nice and hot. Drop you in slowly and then we keep it hot until that little bead changes. Turns more into a, uh, what's the word? Rather than beading up around the edges, it forms more of a uh, bevel, I guess. There is a proper word for it that I learned doing 3D modelling that I can't remember. But anyway, these have properly bonded to the outside when I'm heating here, which means the solder here being cooler than the solder down below means that the full depth of that, in theory, or should have gone molten and actually correctly bonded with everything. Now I can tell you now, these will be bonded in here strong enough that you can tear this wire apart before that solder bond will come apart. I absolutely guarantee it. One of the reasons I like doing this too is I can grab this cable and yank the plug out with it, knowing that it's not going to destroy the plug. And uh, I often stand on these cables and they come out too. If you're on the water and you've got your hands full and balance is a problem, if there's an emergency with cable like this and you're in a plastic bodied or plastic hulled amphibious vehicle you want to grab that cable and yank it out quick smart so that you don't melt a hole through and yes I often use fuses as you should and circuit breakers and all the rest but sometimes things happen 
let's let these cool off and peel everything off it. All right, I've got both ends done and they're cooled off a bit. And now we're going to go on the, um, the section where we get the blue tack off. You basically take another chunk of this stuff and you continually tab it, dab it on here and lift it off. Some of the stuff that I've heated is powdering away a bit and that's pretty normal, but a fresh cool bit of blue tack will peel most of that off. Anything you can't get off, you can get off with a little bit of IPA. Now we have a bit of um, solder that's flowed into there, we'll fix that in a moment. And that is pretty easy to fix as well. I'm going to just get all of this stuff off. Yep, and this one's got a bit of overflow of solder on there as well. So we'll clean that up. So how we deal with this, is we just simply get a bit of heat on the outside till we see that solder start to get molten and give it a bit of a flick. There we go. There we go. Oh, almost overdid that one. Yep. <laughs> and I've tipped it off and fallen it off. That's what happens when you go too far. So I've got to start again with that one. Let's try with this one. And I should indicate you've got to be quick. We're almost molten. There we go. That's really all you've got to do. I'll put this other one back on. Now... Having that connector come off, I must confess, wasn't quite the accident it may have appeared to be. Trying to demonstrate one of the other advantages to this method is that you can actually remove these and reuse them. I'm going to add a bit more solder in here. So it is very easy to recycle these plugs. And a little gas torch like this is pretty easy to keep in the field. So, uh, in terms of field repairs, which seems to be a bulk of where I really need to be doing stuff. Um, in terms of that, it would be pretty easy to recycle this cable for another purpose. Now, we're going to let this cool off. We're going to get the excess blue tack off. Then we're going to put a little bit of heat shrink on them, just for, you know, cosmetic sake. Now, I would be shocked if you are watching this video and you don't know what heat shrink tubing is. But this is what it is. It's thermal shrinking tube. You just got to get it above its designed temperature. And there are different temperatures of tubing. And it shrinks down and makes a nice electrically insulating, um, basically coating, I guess. And this stuff is good for, I think, about a thousand volts or thereabouts. Possibly a bit more. All right. Do the other end. It does make the ugly joins look a little bit cleaner. The other thing too is if you do have a little bit of copper exposed behind these, which is pretty much going to happen even if you trim them really short like this, um, you can have a potential for something metal to drop across the back of this plug and um, create a short. And with thick cable, that's a pretty catastrophic thing. Uh, once upon a time, I cut a uh, 24 volt cable on video I need a bit to f whoa <laughs> okay guys unplug it first that's somewhere in the archives too I don't know if I'll find it for this video but um, yeah the, you can get some fireworks all right now we come to the most important part of this video how to put these things in now you might think that that's going to be the easiest part of it and there's still a bit of blue tack I missed on that one. Clean these ends up. When you put them in this plug, two things you should always double check, and I'm, <laughs> I've got that backwards in the past. One is the red for positive and the black for negative. The other is the orientation of these pins. Now, these little paddles here, they're designed to hook underneath that. So when we put them in, you're going to want to slide them in. Now, sometimes I will have done these level. Come on, autofocus, where are you? Focus on that subject. Right. 
So sometimes I have these hooked up this way and they fit into the plug beautifully and then I find out that they should have been that way and it happens often. There's a trick for that if that's the case. So when we're looking at our plug they need to go in this way because our little tongue is going to flip up and no I've got that backwards yet again. So if I put them in that way this bit's going to slide underneath that tongue and hook onto it and I'm going to go yep that fits beautifully and then realize that they're backwards. So you give these a bit of a twist down the length of them and you can include that twist inside that outer insulation. This is something that is fairly easy to do as in get it wrong. So now let's flip these around. They're going to slide under that tongue. And that is going to mean positives in there. You can retract these pins, but I tell you, if you force them in the wrong way around, they are pretty much never going to come out. They're an absolute pain. So I like to get a screwdriver on the back of this, on that lip, and push them in. But with thick cable, they should pretty much just slide straight in. Yep, so there is one, and it's gone click and popped in there. Again, autofocus, pick that bit. I dropped this camera a while ago and using this midfield lens, I think I messed up the autofocus on it. All right, now, where is our thing there? He has twisted back around again. That's why he's not going in. We'll push this guy in. Autofocus, keep up with the game here. Push you in. If I do this right, we should be able to see him pop in like that. Radio, and we have an Anderson plug. Alright, let's do the other end. One thing I do whenever I'm making an extender like this is I plug in both of these and I check that the colours match up. Because at this stage, even if I've got them the wrong way around, <laughs> as long as the colours match up, I haven't made a crossover lead, which is going to be fine. And with these, you can pull them apart like that and they're not going to rip the plugs or the wires out of the back of the plug. So, that's pretty much it. That's how I do an Anderson plug. That'll be my thumbnail there somewhere and I'll hide my damaged finger. There we go. So, um, yeah, I'm sure you, there's going to be a discussion about this. Every time I do an Anderson plug, there is usually some kind of a discussion. So, I'm doing this. It's also absolutely pelting down rain outside. I should be putting grease in the um, outer bearings of the 8x8 Argo because it's sat there for four days after a fairly significant water run. And there's about a bunch of other stuff I should be doing. But I'm tired and I'm overloaded and this is about all I can do in a day. This is the end of my energy. And this is pretty much what happens this time of year as well as with multiple sclerosis. And my next treatment is right before Christmas, so I'm going to have a pretty crap Christmas this year too, uh, for a number of reasons. Anyway, I'm going to pack up all this stuff and stop advertising for Dell, and uh, yeah, let's uh, see what I come up with next time, and I hope you enjoyed it.